Have you ever played competitive TF2 before? Or, well, watched it before? Usually it looks like this. So, new strategy for Furtick. We'll see if it pays off. Well, the Furtick is so aggressive on the right. Maze in the air. He's gonna get the pack and eat another rocket, but the nuke oh is coming. Green juice. Oh my god. Just, it's the there's collapse. just six Froyo players around the truck and they get demolished. They only lose Kevin throughout the entire ordeal. But there's usually one common thread between all of these. What classes are being played? Besides stalemates when one team inevitably goes sniper and the game comes to a crawl, the competitive TF2 lineup is two soldiers, two scouts, a demo man, and a medic. And it's been this way for over 10 years, to the point where most of the casual scene seem to think that competitive players literally never play any other class, which isn't true, but does have an air of truth to it. For example, Engineer and Heavy are used for almost every single last hold in a 5CP match, and Engineer should be present in every 5CP last hold if the team is playing optimally. Pyre is used to deny Uber, especially on last, and Sniper is used whenever there's a stalemate or players think that they're better than they are. Spy is used by far the least of all the mercs because he gets worse the more you play him, due to losing the element of surprise. However, it's extremely rare to see a team run a non-traditional class full-time. I have heard of one team that ran Sniper full-time, but before our season, I hadn't seen anyone that's tried Engineer, Heavy, or Pyro in a serious manner. So, it was time to change that with my second favorite class, the Engineer. In previous videos that I've made, I've stated that besides Spy, you can get away with playing any class that you want in Sixes, especially at a lower level and it was time to actually prove that. I went ahead and asked some of my old teammates and friends if they'd be willing to accompany me on this journey, and I recruited Scary Broccoli, who was my old roamer to play Demo Man, Trucks for Ducks, who played Demo, and Medic to play Soldier, our friend JJ, who's actually a sniper player, to play Pocket Scout, and myself playing Engineer to replace Flank Scout. We signed up our team and started doing tryouts before the season started. Honestly, I was really worried for our week one match on Gully Wash. We didn't get to scrim much, and some of our scrims were really scuffed. But through it all, we did end up picking up our medic for the season, the Micro Cheese. At this point, we were really close to the start of the season and still needed to try out roamers, which were finding teams. Thankfully, my old teammate Hax knew a guy who was interested, and he joined our team to play roamer. That being Burke and we picked him up the day before matches. So I was really nervous going into the scrim and match since this is now when everything matters, but we got into our scrim and we did really well. This was a pretty big surprise to me because in sixes, there's generally a consensus of maps that are stronger or weaker for scout with the two weaker maps being Gully Wash and Metalworks and the other five CP maps being more scout favored. Because of this, I wasn't sure if scout maps would be better for engineer or soldier maps. I don't think I have a clear-cut answer on that, but I can say that Gully Wash wasn't as bad as I was expecting. With decent teleporter locations, good places for dispenser placement while still being able to cover a choke, and sentry gun locations to punish overextending players or sacks onto the medic, especially while holding second, it was a lot better than I was expecting. So when we won the first half of the scrim 5-3, it was more than I was expecting. And some of the strats that I could do with NG were great. And while I was taking notes, I had a massive realization. With the team running Engineer full-time, or full-time after mid, our strategies were a lot different than most teams, which was a good thing, and a bad thing. It was really good because most teams didn't know what to do against us, and if they had a mentor, couldn't really get help against us. So when they played us, if they refused to adapt to our playstyle, they just got rolled and lost. And if they did adapt, we had a real game on our hands. The flip side of this is, well, there was nothing substantial to pull from. There isn't a guide on how to play Engineer in Sixes yet, how to roll out, play the mids, where to get set up, and when, and etc, etc. So I did the best thing I could. I spent hours and hours going over maps, finding mobility spots for Engineer, where I could place buildings to be the most effective, then spent more time demo reviewing, checking to see how teams played against us, reviewing my team as well as my own mistakes and how to fix them, and finally getting the best player I know to help out. Anyway, we rolled into the match, and at this point, I was pretty confident. I played really well in the pregame. My team was having a good time, so even if we lost the first match like I was expecting, 
we'd still be all right, and hopefully we can just go even throughout the season on wins and losses. But then... Beast! Beast Century! <laughs> we won. And we won 5-0. to zero. We didn't drop a single round. Really quickly, I want to talk about one aspect of map design. It's really hard and I respect mappers a lot, but one thing that I see very often in maps is not considering the engineer. Whether that be making certain spots buildable that shouldn't be, or having spots that should be buildable but aren't. What I'm used to in maps is most props not being buildable, or places that you can climb to but not being able to build up there. Thankfully, a lot of competitive sixes maps actually do let you, which is honestly a huge surprise. I'm mostly used to maps really just considering soldier for rocket jumping, sniper for sightlines, and scout for props, and that's about it. This can be great, with some maps not really considering certain techs that you can do as engineer, with my personal favorite being climbing onto your buildings and bringing them with you when you jump off of them. Now, we're moving on to the next map, Bagel, which you may know from casual as Cauldron during Scream Fortress, but I just need to say, this map is a competitive engineer's dream for building. You can build on just about anything, and because of that, you can get really creative. We had scrims the next day on Bagel after a clear-cut match, and we got them reviewed to improve over the weekend. It was a great start to the season. When the next week rolled around on Tuesday, I was fairly confident going in, and we shut out both teams that we played. The first team was respectful and really nice, but the second team... they rage quit. After reviewing and hopping around Bagel, I think I can confidently say that it is one of, if not the best, engineer map in the pool. There's just a lot of really good spots for buildings, and most places are buildable, so there's no weird confusion about why you can or can't build somewhere. And placements can help. Like the dispenser right here is a bit out of the way for the combo, but it gives our medic a valuable asset. Dispenser armor. Whenever an uber is incoming and we don't have, or he's being chased by hit scan class, he can just crouch inside the dispenser and the dispenser will absorb most of the damage to him. For those of you who don't play competitive TF2, this is really, really important. In competitive TF2, uber is the meta centralizing mechanic. When you get uber, you generally have a massive advantage over the other team and in 5CP, you can use it to take a point, or possibly roll it into two or more, with the other team trying not to die to your uber, and kite points to give you as little as possible. But, in King of the Hill, where there's only one point and a hard time limit before one team wins, uber becomes even more important. Because of this, you get things like four-man sacks, where a team will have four players die trying to kill the enemy medic, while their own medic and scout sit at spawn and build uber. So, if you give your own medic dispenser armor and a sentry gun, it makes sacking a lot harder. So the next day we rolled into scrims, had a great time, then barely eked out the W in our match. It was pretty rough since a teammate and I were lagging out pretty badly, but we pushed through and we got the win. Another quick interjection here, because I want to talk about 5CP. I feel like 5CP is such a weird game mode in TF2 because of the dichotomy of how it's played between casual and competitive. In competitive, it's a great back and forth with high stakes and some stalemates here and there, but overall, it flows pretty well. But when you get to casual, most people don't seem to know how to play it, or at least they forget core TF2 fundamentals when they do. In 5CP, you push off of advantages and hold on disadvantages. That's pretty much it. But in my experience, even in places like Uncle Topia, I've had a lot of issues with my team refusing to push, even against only three players. And I think it's because of this lack of understanding or practice of playing 5CP, it's led into a spiral of players having issues with 5CP, even though the maps are better than ever now. So because players didn't initially get placed into 5CP, they don't play 5CP. And since they don't play 5CP, they don't know how to play 5CP. And because they don't know how to play it, whenever they inevitably do play it, they have a bad experience or one that they're not used to in TF2, leading them to play less 5CP and less and the cycle continues. The only exception to this rule in my experience is Foundry. Maybe it's because the last point seems like a last point on an attack defend map, but it seems that most players can get the hang of Foundry, and it's always been in my rotation because of that. Okay, okay, get to the point, Quick. Alright. 
5 CP is great. It solves a lot of issues that plague the community at the moment, with the most popular maps in North America being open but being able to keep snipers in check with notable cover, high risk for certain angles to bombs, and a bunch of entrances to last to give multiple peaking angles on turtling engineers. However, there are a lot of problems with 5 CP as well, namely that stalemating can be a way to win or to reset the clock to replay mid. I mean, during I-69 Grand Finals, there was more stalemate time than any other type of time. And right now, it's really hard to push last, which is something that casual players are also familiar with. With maps like Badwater and Upward being extremely popular, but having extremely egregious last points by modern standards. So how do we make it harder to defend without putting the defending team on low ground or something like that? Well, the obvious answer to me is to add a vestibule. That's it. Granary, which is a map that launched with TF2, has this. And while I don't like Granary generally as a map, I do think we can take this one thing from it. So why Vestibule? Well, right now when defending last, Engineer can resup over and over to get maximum health and ammo. The same can be said for any class, like Demo Man resupplying to spam stickies onto the cart and casual payload. In sixes, as a pocket soldier, I can say that a very common strategy is to force the enemy team to use Uber on you, then immediately rocket jump back to the spawn and resupply to get all of your health and ammo back instantly to then jump back in the fight. When you add a vestibule, it makes it so the defending team has to make a choice. Do you resup and leave your team without a player for 10 seconds? Or do you kite around spawn and stay in the fight? It's an interesting question to ask, and depending on your team, it depends. The same question applies for off classes. For example, with Engineer, when defending last, you build a level 3 sentry gun, then with the other team actually pushes in, you hide and spawn until it gets destroyed, then switch to scout. With a vestibule, do you just stay Engineer? It's a question that crosses your mind at least. Moving back a bit, after the other team rage quit from the scrim on Bagel, the strategy planning for Metaworks had begun. We came up with some strategies for pushing and holding each point, but we had one problem, and kind of a major one. I was expecting to have to do this at some point with Process and Sunshine for other reasons, but I didn't really think about it for Metaworks. And that is... that the rollout is way too long. So each map has multiple rollouts in mid-fight strategies that you can do. And for Metalworks, you can either have a head-on slogfest mid, a weird rotational mid, or do a really passive hiding in valley mid. And if you do the last one, and the other team is smart enough to not just throw themselves into you, the last mid can be nicknamed losing. So what do I do here? Do I just bait my team every mid? No. I just swap to scout to play the mid, then when I die, I swap back to engineer. It's kind of like the opposite of what you do as a scout player after holding last. Usually when you're holding last, you have at least one scout off class. It depends on the situation for who you'll pick, but if you have time, you'll go with Engineer and build a level 3 sentry. Then, after the other team pushes in and you win the last hold, you swap back to scout to push second. So, I'm doing the opposite. Instead of last, I'm doing the mid fight. And instead of swapping from Engineer back to scout, I'm swapping from scout to Engineer. I'll have to do this with two more maps, but I'll explain more when we get to process. The week of Metalworks was pure hell as a team leader. Our roamer was out of town, then our soldier sub was out, and our last sub was in India. So we had to get ringers for the week, and the other team didn't want to reschedule. But on match day, we couldn't use the ringer we had in our scrims, so I had to get another ringer who was denied. So I put out an LFR post and got a few players, but they were too high level or hadn't played before. So I went to team leaders that weren't playing their match that day, who then told me all of their soldiers couldn't. But thankfully, the enemy team actually found a ringer for us for roamer. So we roll into our pregame, and we're having a good time, and our medic's power goes out. So we scramble for another ringer, and we do get one. So I'm super nervous going to the match. Are we going to be too chaotic? Are the ringers going to suck? I don't know. So we get in, and win 5-0. to zero. <laughs> It was a total slog, though. The first half was 2-0, to zero, and the second half was really slow, except for the last round. There were absolutely clutch plays, but thankfully we made it out unscathed and moved on to Snakewater. The first day of scrims for Snakewater was different than normal since we were only playing one. Our demo was out for the first time slot and we didn't want to have to ring two players again. So we get into the second time slot and play half of the game. We roll the half and I send the demo to Banny to review. He gets back to me with a fantastic review with one extremely validating section. 
Okay, this time you're going through catwalk. Ooh, I like that. I like that move. I was actually just thinking about whether a sentry on the roof would be worthwhile. This is, this is insane. Oh my god, this is beast. That's gotta be my favorite NG move I've seen yet. A lot of potential with that, like jumping off your own sentry. I like it. We change a few things and I move my sentry around a bit. Overall, scrims went well, but the match was an issue. We needed to have our match rescheduled since our pocket soldier, who knows how we play, was gonna be out. So we put in to reschedule to a day earlier, and the other team denies it, saying that they couldn't play, then also denied all possible ringers I had, and then later we found out at the time we wanted to play, they were scrimming, so they totally could have played us fair and square, but they didn't. We tried to get a substitute to come in, but he couldn't make it, and we had to ring someone who didn't play soldier to play pocket soldier, and we got destroyed because of it, and we lost 5-2. to two. A super disappointing loss, especially considering that it was mostly out of our control, but Snakewater was a favorite map of ours, and the loss wasn't actually the worst thing to happen to us. But it just goes to show that as a team leader, I should have rostered more reliable substitutes for my team, and I didn't do that. So because of that, we lost. A lesson learned for the season. After that loss, it was a bit stressful on the team because something important was coming up. LAN. For those of you who don't know what LAN is, basically it's when a bunch of competitors go to one location to all play the same game together to get rid of online lag. There was a lot of LANs in 2022, but this one was only an 8 hour drive from me over to Philly. So I was going. And not only was I going, I was going to help run it as an admin. Our medic went to the resup LAN as well, which was nice to meet up with him, but it made getting scrims really stressful. Because it meant that we had less time to scrim since I'd be busy driving and setting up, and when we played our match, I wouldn't be at home. So I'd be playing in a new environment, which does mess with you a bit. The week itself was a bit tricky, because our success really banked on one thing. Did the soldiers double bomb on mid, and were we prepared for it? During the first day of scrims, we absolutely were not, and we just got rolled out of mid, and then forward held in a way that was difficult for us to break out of. But with a few adjustments to the rollout and how we played, we made it work for the scrims that we played. So after a night of scrims, I decided that I didn't want to get up in the morning to drive over and actually drove overnight to Philly, stopping for a bit, but making it there during the day to catch up with Dolphin, who you probably know from RGL, and set up in our room together. Then I met Dr. Underscore, who does production work for TFTV, and then Banny, who is running the event and needs no introduction. So we prepped together for a bit, I was given the run through of the setup, and I chilled for a bit leading up to our match. We actually didn't have a pre-game scrim, which was really scary, probably because a lot of people were out because of LAN, and our match was rescheduled, which didn't help. So right before our match, I go ahead and rent a computer, and run into some familiar faces that showed up to the venue, which I told my team about, and they wanted to meet. So this is what they got. Oh, dude, get Habib in here to, like, to bless me, bro. All right. Dude, I'm actually... Wait, if, 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 if Habib starts talking, I squeeze Mike. I'm gonna freak out. It's actually... We, we can't lose if he comes over here. What? Whoa, Twitch has a delay thing? Like a Hello? legit? Yo, are you guys running an RGL match right now? We're going to be in like, in like oh, two minutes. Hey, hey, good luck, bro. You have you have my blessing, all right? Oh, hit we can't every... lose now. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely can't hey, lose hit, now. Hit every sticky, hit every pipe. You got this, bro. I will. Wait, what map are you guys playing? Product. Oh, Viaduct? Okay, okay, okay. Alright, get keep that ammo management in check too and you'll be perfectly fine, my boy. Alright. Alright, good luck guys. Thanks, Abib. Alright. Oh, we can't, can't lose. Can't we can't lose last now. Say too? All right, what? Oh no, Sandblast is here now. What's up, pussies? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Yo, let me play the let me play this match as scout real quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. Nah, <laughs> uh, you how you guys doing? Fantastic. Yeah, you're playing full time NG? That's hype. <laughs> yeah. That's badass. Honestly, playing full time engineer? That's sick. Gotta yeah, evolve the meta, you know? Alright, yeah. well, hopefully you guys win. A blessing from the legendary Habib and Sandblast. We were ready. We ended up losing the first round of the match, 
But as soon as the second round started, we kicked it up a notch, didn't lose a single other round, and won 4-1. to one. Throughout the whole season, there were two maps that I was afraid of, Process and Sunshine. And for one major reason, how the mid plays. Not only is Process mid a relatively far distance away from last, but depending on how the mid is played, it can be really bad for Engineer. So on Process mid, either both teams go in the same direction and get into a confrontational mid with soldiers bombing around and players fighting for the high ground, which is hard for an Engineer to get onto, or you have a rap mid, where players keep going around and around in a circle to catch people out and kill the stragglers on the enemy team. The latter is what I was afraid of, because as many of you probably know, Engineer is not fast. So I'd be the one who got left behind, and we'd very likely lose because of it. So after the experience on Metalworks, I decided to do the same thing for Process, where I'd run Scout to mid, but sometimes I would use Engineer when we were planning to do a confrontational mid as a mix-up. Overall, process was a fun week, but it was a total disarray. One of our soldiers couldn't make it, and we had to pick up someone new, so that way we didn't repeat Snakewater week. And thankfully, we did. Fresh joined our team two days before our match, and was a move-up who just hadn't played it in the season so far. We got one full day of scrims rather than our normal three, and headed into the match relatively nervous. The reason being that the team that we were playing was one of the teams that beat us badly during scrims the previous week on products. They shot us out 3-0 in 10 minutes, and we had it into halftime. They were ready to take two more rounds in the second half, but our team took five minutes to slow down and talk about what was going wrong and how to fix it. After our discussion, we went into a fast second half where my team took four rounds and didn't give up a single round, closing out the game 4-3, and getting the extremely satisfying reverse victory. Heading into ClearCut, I was extremely confident. I had watched Froyotech have an engineer on ClearCut before, and I was ready to replicate their success. We had extremely good scrims where we were able to learn a lot, and I played the map a lot previously. ClearCut is actually one of my favorite Koth maps up there with Bagel and above High Pass and Kong King. The map is great for soldiers and scouts as there's enough variation to high and low ground to make movement interesting, high bomb potentials, good pack locations, and a large sniper sightline but one that is easily checked, and an interesting mid that has cover for both teams. But because of the cover, Clearcut actually has a slightly different meta than other Koth maps. Instead of pretty much always forward holding on an advantage, the meta instead for many teams is actually to bunker in your shed while the other team sacks into you when they don't have uber. Then hold a bit more aggressively when they push in. Get the force and then pop your uber a bit later and try to prevent people from getting behind you. Something that a sentry gun and dispenser armor would help with in all three cases. Plus a relatively good teleporter location if you keep holding the point. But in my pride, I didn't demo review our scrims for the first time. And it bit us. We might have had good scrims, but we headed into our match during the first half and we just got mulched with two of our players, including myself, not even getting a single kill. Then the second half, we were much closer, going into double overtime and being close to winning, but just got shut out 4-0. The first time we had been shut out the entire season. There's not much to say regarding this week, other than it mostly falls into my shoulders as a team leader. I've played the map before, and a few of my teammates hadn't, and I didn't explain it very well. I didn't demo review, and most importantly, I didn't plan enough with Engineer. After playing the map for a while and experimenting, I realized something really quickly in my scrims though, but I thought I could brute force through it. Which is that, as Engineer, there aren't many great places to place your buildings offensively, and there are a few places that you think should be buildable, but aren't due to some clipping or map brushing issues. But the worst one is that for some reason, the entire roof isn't buildable. Something that would be a boon for offensive engineers. To be able to climb up to the top, drop a mini on the roof, then drop down to shotgun players. Balanced out by how easy it is to spam, especially from range so buildings can't stay up there for long. Clearcut is still a good map, but it likely won't get worked on for a while because the map creator is in the military. So for now, it'll just remain a hard map for engineers. With the loss on ClearCut, I didn't want to take any chances on Sunshine, especially since it was the other map I was afraid of. 
Our team was 5-2, and two, which isn't a bad spot to be in, but if we wanted to guarantee that we made playoffs, my main goal for the season, we had to win. If we lost, then we would have a chance to make it in or not, all dependent on how the other teams did relative to us. And I was kind of afraid of Sunshine, even though it's a map I love. Sunshine is a tough map for newer players, and there are a lot of common mistakes that are made. So for the first time since Metalworks, Broccoli and I explained the map completely from scratch, as if my other players had never played it before. Then we explained what we wanted to do, and what mistakes we wanted to avoid. There was a lot of preparation for Sunshine on a team level and a personal level. Combing over every single point to find sentry spots that had good angles, places I could quickly place guns down, possible dispenser climbs, pressure points for the gun, dispenser armor placement, and teleporter locations for quick recommits, especially after a sack. So we headed to the match, and it's against a team ironically called Highlander Gaming. And we head into the first half, roll the first mid, not knowing it was going to be the last one we won that half. We go ahead and roll the round and win. Then we get straight into the next mid fight, lose, then get reverse rolled and lose a round. Then we get to mid, lose it and have a huge long slog back and forth until we finally win a round. Then we lose the mid and get rolled to last, hold for a bit, then lose the round. And finally for the half again, we lose the mid again, hold for a while, then lose the round again. Heading into halftime, losing 3-0 after what felt like a slog of a game. As we talk during halftime, we discuss what's going wrong because we need to figure it out soon. They only need to win two rounds before they win, and we need three. So we talk about it as a team, and Broccoli says to the team that it seems like the enemy team doesn't do well against fast plays and pushes, so we should give it a shot. So we do. We get into the next half and basically overwhelm them as a team together, winning the mid, rolling to last, spawn camping, and tying up the game 3-3 three three all in one minute. We get to the next mid, do the same thing, win the mid, but get into stalemate and lose the round. They need one more round to win the game. And at that moment, we could have decided to slow the game down and play more carefully, but we decided to commit to the overwhelming strategy. So we do it again. We win the mid again, roll them to last, and win in a minute and a half. It's tied 4-4. to four. Next round wins. We commit with the same strategy, and it just works. We roll the mid for the last time, winning all of them this half, take them to their last, and have a successful last push, winning us the game 5-4, to four, all within a bit over a minute. We made it. We were guaranteed to make it into playoffs, no matter how any other team did. My goal for the season was realized, and we were solidified as a top team to play in playoffs, and I didn't care how we did. I was just happy we made it. The first round of playoffs was interesting to say the least, because of a few reasons. One was that we weren't able to fill all of our scrim times, as is typical during playoffs, but we did end up having teams reach out to us to scrim us, and had people play against us that supported what we were doing. It was a really nice change of pace. And for the first time, we had to scrim multiple maps at the same time, because during playoffs, teams take turns deciding what maps they want to play or not play. And because of that, we needed to look at what maps we were good at, bad at, what we liked and didn't like. Then guess how the other team felt, that way we didn't accidentally give them a map that they're good at. So I took a gamble guessing what maps they would ban, so that way we would practice what I thought would be picked. So I looked at their logs, their wins and losses, and ours, and had a few predictions. What I didn't predict was that I would be 100% correct and we had the best outcome for our first playoffs match. Because it is a playoffs match, after all, we were expecting to have a fight on our hands, especially since we were given a warning by a fellow team that the guys that we were playing against were a bit toxic and had beaten them in the past, and they were a fellow playoffs team. But as we roll into the server, after a lot of practice and talking, we get ready to play Bagel. And as Bagel starts and we win the mid, we didn't realize what we were actually going to do. We laid out one of the hardest beatdowns we have ever had in the history of our team. The other team made all of the mistakes that Engineer absolutely capitalizes over and lets his team take advantage of. It was the perfect culmination of what we had learned over the season and we had learned to do well against and adapt against. Fortunately for us, the team that we were playing against was a team that refused to adapt to what we were doing and how we play and play disorganized, mostly relying on their DM. We rolled Bagel in one four to zero. We make it onto the Snake Water and expect a lot more coming from the enemy team as Bagel was our map choice and Snake Water was theirs. 
with Bagel being a great map for Engineer and Snake Water just being a good one. So we go ahead and roll up to the mid, and the same story repeats itself. We absolutely crush the other team and roll into a win of 5-0, with the other team refusing to adapt and starting to focus certain players on our team rather than playing together to beat us. So it was a quick win with a short night, something that most of the team wanted so they could go to bed early. But two of us guessed that one of the enemy players was streaming because of them having a TTV in their name. So we searched it up and wanted to get an idea of what their thought process was going against us, since it would give us a good idea of how to prepare against other teams, since we hadn't had someone else's stream as a resource before. There's nothing really to note, except for one thing a player said. Yeah, this is a pretty good time to talk about the 6v6 whitelist. For those of you who are out of the loop, not all items in TF2 are allowed in competitive modes, and the ban can vary from format, those being 6s in Highlander, to region, such as RGL in North America and E2F2L in Europe. RGL has the least amount of bans from any region, but there are still quite a few weapons that are banned that don't need to be. Engineer has three weapon bans, those being the Rescue Ranger, the Short Circuit, and the Wrangler. So if you've been wondering why I haven't been using the Wrangler on last holds or anything like that, that's why. It's not allowed. I wouldn't say that Engineer is nerfed significantly due to his weapon bans though. More so that Cheese of Last Point Recepts is being nerfed specifically for Engineer, which I don't think is fair to be honest, and I'd rather see a map design change rather than just banning items. That being said, everything else for Engineer is allowed, and it's a lot of fun. As a plug here, if you do want to play competitive TF2 and don't want to deal with a whitelist, in RGL there is the No Restriction 6s format, which is just Valve competitive. There's an upcoming cup for it, and it's a format I like a lot, and I run in RGL. So if you want to play it and see it continue to be run, please sign up and keep an eye out for more NR6s events. At the moment, RGL is the only lead to have run it at the time of writing, and with more support, it'll give us a reason to run it more. Anyway, back to playoffs. The second round of playoffs was difficult. Since there were less and less teams in playoffs, there were less and less teams playing, and with less teams playing, there were less teams to scrim. On top of that, we couldn't practice much due to Broccoli having a surprise mold problem. We ended up losing the match, but it was mostly on me. Not for playing Engineer or playing poorly, but because a mistake I made as a team leader on who I was going to field for the match. It's a mistake that I regret, but I've learned from and have gotten over. I reached my goal for the season, which was making playoffs, and winning the first round was the icing on the cake. Our season was over, and it was a great one. And with time to reflect, I'm happy I did it. So one thing I really want to address since I know it'll be asked, why don't I just play Highlander? And the answer is, I did. I actually started playing Highlander while I was playing Sixes so I could play TF2 and not have to play Soldier while also being able to have a team. So I played a few seasons of Highlander as Engineer and also played a few seasons in Cups of Prolander, a tweaked version of Highlander with seven players instead of nine so people can off class. I did have fun in both Highlander and Prolander, and I even got a few medals, but there are a few major issues with both game modes, but more so in Highlander, which is the more popular format over Prolander. The main issue with both formats is the meta. Sixes has a meta as well, but it's much more fun to play than the Highlander meta. To put it in the most basic way for people to understand, you can have a tier list of all the classes for each format, and Medic will always be number one, and then Demo will always be number two. It's just the way things are. Medic is the most powerful class in the game with heals, overheals, ubers, and arrows. Demo Man is the second most powerful class in the game with massive damage potential. Now that leaves the third best class within a format up for grabs. And it may be map dependent or game mode dependent, but generally there's a clear cut answer on who's the defining class of a format. For sixes, that's scout, which is why you can hear people joke that sixes is the scout game mode. For Highlander, it's sniper, and you can't argue otherwise. Because of that, Highlander is by nature a lot slower and is far more frustrating to play than Sixes, in my opinion. In Highlander, each class has a specific role to be filled, which may range from being great and fun like playing Demo Man, doing basically what you do in a pub but with support like Sniper, or doing the most boring worst job in the game of babysitting the medic and occasionally denying Ubers like Pyro. But because there has to be every single class present, each role gets boiled down and can be a prison for the respective classes. Engineer is very much one of the classes that gets bogged down by Highlander and pigeonholed into a boring role. Building level 3s for defense, abusing the Wrangler, 
basically just becoming a sentry gun and pushing the cart since most teams think that Engineer is useless on offense. And that's the meta. I can't blame anyone for playing this way, and I've played with invite players that break the mold, but they aren't topping invite at the moment. It's just not a fun place to be if you're a more experimental or aggressive player like I am. While Sixes doesn't have attack defend or payload to boost Engineer's viability due to the lack of maps being created for Sixes, that doesn't mean you can't try to break the mold yourself and have a good time. So with out of the way, what would I like to see? For Sixes, I'd like to see a reduction of restrictions, and RGL is moving in the right direction again with the unbanning of the Buffalo Stake this season. But I do think that about half of the banned weapons could be unbanned with relatively minor to no impact of the current meta. To add to that, I'd really like to see 5CP experiment more with adding vestibules to last again and see how that impacts last holds. And if specific spammed items out of last like the short circuit and rescue ranger could be unbanned. I'd also like to see more public support of this in general. Not just from those that are playing in the leagues, but also the viewers and general public of TF2. Then I want to see players be more welcoming to non-traditional team lineups. This season wasn't bad for me, and there was even a team that ran a full-time heavy, but that's not to say that there weren't some teams that hated us. And last, Valve, if you're watching, I have two things. There's definitely some tweaking that can be done balance-wise in TF2. Not much needs to be done, but there definitely are some problem items. And I think I can say with some authority that the Wrangler does need to be nerfed. If you have any questions about my thoughts, you can reach out to me. And if you want to work with the community again and have us meet you halfway this time, we can now. And I can fairly confidently say that as someone who works in RGL. So reach out if that's something you're interested in, whether it's just to get data from us from running things or just to say hi. For anyone who's thinking about trying this, I'm making a far less edited video on how to play Engineer and Sixes with the rollouts to do, building placement, and what you should expect from your teammates. It'll be pretty long, but it should be a good starting point for anyone who's interested. For those of you who are giving it a shot, good luck, and I hope to see you out there.